Welcome. I'm Gwen Deglise, Deputy Director for the American Cinematheque. And thank you for joining uh, the conversation about One Night in Miami with writer Cam Powers and actors Aldis Hodge, Leslie Odom Jr., Ellie Gore, and Kingsley Ben Adir. The, the, the moderator is film critic Jacqueline Colley from Rotten Tomatoes. I'd like to thank Amazon Studios for making this conversation possible. And I'd like to invite you to visit our website, americancinematech.com, where you can find the latest information about our upcoming programs and how to support the American Cinematheque by becoming a member, making a donation, and how you can sign up for eBlast. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Coley, and welcome to American Cinematheque's Amazon Week. I have the esteemed honor to moderate this next conversation with the cast and filmmakers of One Night in Miami. So please allow me to welcome them. First, we have writer Kemp Powers, actor Leslie Odom Jr., who plays Sam Cook, actor Aldous Hodge, who plays Jim Brown, actor Kingsley Ben Adir, who plays Malcolm X, and actor Eli Gore, who plays Muhammad Ali slash Cassius Clay. Gentlemen. So, so glad to chat with you. Uh, the film is, it's incredible to think that it's gonna reach such a large audience with Amazon. It's one of the great parts about being with such a global distributor. But before we get to like this movie that has just had this incredible reception, still 90, 98% certified fresh on the tomato meter. Kemp, let's start with you because it started with you. These are probably four of the most famous black men in the world. So why did you want to tackle this for not only your first screenplay, but your first play adaptation? It's quite an ambitious ask. Yeah, I guess ignorance is bliss, right? Like I didn't know what I was getting into. So, um, but no, I mean, these guys, these four, the four real men were, were all personal heroes of mine. And when I first made the discovery back in my previous life as a journalist, that this night really did happen, um, my imagination just, just went wild. Um, but... <clears throat> In, in trying to tell a story that of course the conversation is fictional. I really wanted to kind of do my best to do a just characterization of each of these men and, and what they represented to just provide a platform for a conversation, a fly on the wall conversation as far as the audience is concerned that um, black people um, in the Western world I'd even argue have been having since long before this night in 1964 and are, and are having to, to this day. I mean, the play element of it, what, the wonderful thing about the play is I was able to see the play performed on three continents. So I realized that this experience that I thought was very specifically black American, I had to expand my own thinking and realize that black, black men in the Western world. So it, whether you're a black Brit, a black Canadian, a black Brazilian, hella black South African, I saw it resonate with audiences because it played in South Africa too. Um, it played in London and, and it really connected to the community there. So I realized these are not just conversations that we as black American men are having, but, um, and I don't wanna speak for you Kingsley or you Eli, but I just feel like this idea of your place um, in the Western world as a, as a black man is something that is on a lot of people's minds, so. Oh yeah. Yeah, incredibly well said too. And um, we would not be, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge uh, the woman who is so very much responsible for everything they got to see, of course, the incomparable Regina King. And Kim, I just want to talk about your first conversations with her because I, I know like Keith and Regina and like this whole thing came together as kind of a team, but talk about her joining as director and just how y'all decided this was the way to go with it. Well, when she first read the script, she was still shooting Watchmen. So our first, and I was actually already working on Soul for Pixar. So our first conversation was a Skype call um, pre-pandemic. This was, um, it was, uh, I, I forgot, I think it was like August or, or so. I, I don't remember. So it was sometime in, 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 yeah, whenever it happened. She was in Atlanta. I was in Northern California. We had a really great conversation. Regina just connected to the material. And you know, being a screenwriter, you're kind of used to being removed from the equation after the script kind of goes on. So I was just trying to answer as many of Regina's questions as possible, hoping that she would come on and direct this film. Um, and she was the one who was just like, um, yeah, I want you to stay involved um, and be a part of this process. Um, and she, she told me, I mean, I wish she were here because she told me that the story resonated to her so strongly because it made her think of so many of the black men in her lives. 
So like her son, her, her uncles, her, you know, her father. Um, and that was really powerful. And, and of course, I thought that her reputation preceded her and she's lived up to and exceeded anything that, I, that I've ever heard about Regina King positively. Um, and on top of that, I think that this is a very testosterone filled story. And I think it gets balanced and it gets improved by, by having um, uh, a black woman at the helm as the captain of the ship. And that's exactly what she was. So, so I think the end result, this film wouldn't be what it is um, if, if not for Regina's really deft hand. Yeah, this film especially proves that female filmmaking does not necessarily always mean putting women on the as the subject it really means the female gaze and i think she really exemplifies how the female gaze of filmmaking is remarkable um gentlemen the four of you obviously all actors and regina was like you know just dusting off that oscar getting ready to go dust off some more emmys um but is it i would just want to ask both uh, all four of you as far as being directed by an actor director and especially someone like Regina who's still doing it literally right now still going through the motions. I'm just going to ask each one of you what you found to be particularly valuable about how she was able to bring it to you, knowing that she's literally about to go, you know, she just got off a flight doing it in Watchmen and uh, Leslie I'll start with you. Oh, I just, um, I just found that she brought the same nose for truth, the same sensitivity that we've grown accustomed to seeing from her in front of the camera, uh, to her work behind the camera. So she, whenever she took that long walk from behind the camera to over where we were, uh, when she, whenever she was going to offer me a suggestion or a thought, it always sent me down a more truthful path or a more entertaining path. Uh, or more interesting path. And when you, uh, you know, when that happens enough times, the trust that you're able to develop as a result of that, um, I think uh, is just tremendously helpful in the position I was in. That's incredible. Um, Eli, I'm gonna go to you next because I think it would be even more interesting for you because uh, you guys have all done some amazing work, but this was this is really one of the more high profile things you're doing. And so it's first. So what did she help you with from this actor director side? Yeah, I mean, I, I just I really felt like there was nothing that I was doing as an actor that she wasn't aware of or hadn't seen. And so um, I feel like she she always kind of um, was there to kind of catch you if you were doing something like that. That wasn't authentic, or that wasn't uh, that wasn't really present. You know, I felt like there were times when coming from TV and coming from you know different projects that I'd done, where you kind of have to manufacture moments. Sometimes uh, that can be a bad habit that you can get into. And um, she just really reinforced with me that I needed to, you know, just trust first of all the words and trust what Kemp had put down. That it was enough. That you don't need to do anything. You can just you have the character and if you're in the moment and if you're listening uh, you know, to, to your scene partners and they, and they are so invested and so prepared that you can just trust it and something special will happen. Um, you know, and that's, it's a rare project that you get to be on where you can have that kind of trust, not only in your scene partners, but in your director and in the script. It's, you know, it almost never happens. Um, yeah. Unless you're- yeah. And then it always happened. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Thank you. No, yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. And, and I, uh, I really appreciate her genius. Excellent. I will say uh, you're coming off a little bit soft, so I don't know if you're near your mic, if you could come a little bit further and I can hear you better, but you, I, yeah, very well I, said. I have a better, I have a better computer. Is this better or should I? That's perfect right there. I love that. Awesome. <laughs> I was like, I just want to hear everything you're saying. Um, I'll just, I'm going to come to you because you, um, Kemp wrote that incredible opening sort of uh, with you and Bo. And when I went back to rewatch the film, I just kept thinking about it. And that scene, it just speaks to just so much of kind of what life was like at that time, whatever. I'm, a, I'm an eighties baby. And yes, yeah. we all deal with what we deal with, but yeah. I'm also from Montgomery, Alabama and the yeah. way that went down. So talk about that scene, doing that with Bo and just how y'all sort of set that up. It's such an incredible scene. 
Yeah, no, I love that scene. Uh, the reason being that for me, I mean, like I was born in the South too. My mama from the South. My mama grew up running from the KKK. Um, I grew up, uh, we were raised primarily between New York and Jersey as kids, but even in Jersey, we lived in a town that was occupied by the KKK. They not just in the South, they everywhere. So that was very familiar for me. <laughs> and uh, it's such a truth telling scene because you have this person here who doesn't think there's anything wrong with the way they think about a black man. He thinks he's perfectly fine. He thinks he's an ally. He thinks he's a friend, he's a buddy. And it, it, it's so expositional when it comes to what is going on today in terms of how we are treated, what we're dealing with. And when we're fighting up against opposition to people who are reluctant to change or evolve, right? So I think it, it really sets the tone for what it is we have to deal with, the shrouded ignorance. And then you have a man, Jim, who, in my opinion, was taking that moment to define it and not to let it define him. So he uses it as motivation to, to build the legacy that you know we understand today. So it, it really was one of the one of my favorite scenes I've been able to be a part of in my entire career. And to have Regina on to help us navigate, you know, the tone because tone and communication are paramount. And that's something that she really understood brilliantly. And she helped us step up to when there were moments where we didn't get it. You know, she, you know, Kemp wrote a very, I think, uh, strategically brilliant story that had note that connected to note that connected to note, right? And it's all about the tone in terms of how to get there. And she was a leader that we needed to help us understand the subtle nuances we needed to really engage in order to get there in the right way. Um, and, and Kim, you said that that moment for Jim Brown actually came out of a real account he told from, from one of his autobiographies, right? Yeah, man. I mean, I actually, um, I'll read it to you at the end of it. I, I found the passage. I'll read it to you. It's, it's actually Jim Brown's recollection. I'll, I'll read it before yeah. we get off at the end. Let me read it to you when they're done. What's up? What's up? I love this. Uh, this is what's so great about these characters is they're, again, they're historical figures. There's not a single person. I mean, even the most casual of history would know at least two, three, and possibly everybody in this. Um, and Kingsley, no offense, the, the, if we're going to say who had the higher hurdle, it's between you and Eli, depending on who asks. Um, and, and I know that you said that it was a little bit maybe better that you didn't have it coming from you coming from being a brit as opposed to american or was it worse did it make it easier to approach him as a man or did it make it more difficult to not have it the way that we do here in america where he's a huge part of our sort of uh history and sort of uh, education what did i say did i say something yeah you said i think that it made it a little bit easier for you to kind of just approach him as the person because it wasn't like the other ways around uh. I don't remember. I don't know. I, I can't remember saying that. Um, I mean, like I, I read it. I, I, know, I, I probably did. I've been talking about it the last few weeks. Um, I feel, I definitely f feel, the, um, I guess, the, the, you know, the, the job was, the job is always, but particularly with this is to, was to really try and find the humanity and, to try and find the things in Malcolm that connected him to all of us. And thankfully it was the script's amazing for that because that's the only thing you can do with it. You know, if you don't, and I tried it a million different ways over Christmas, you know, I really, I tried so many different angles and it was just, it was very specific. It was a real emotional undercurrent that it required and you know the stakes for what was going on for Malcolm at the time in the in the piece are very very real and connected <laughs> like so it was it was pretty uh, uh easy is not the right word but it, it, it just became a sort of for me it just became about staying in it and just just taking one moment at a time and and knowing that Regina was someone who I could really, really trust in terms of controlling the emotional level of the performance. And then for me, I was sort of set free 
because I could try a million different things and get it wrong seven or eight times, but know that on the, you know, the ninth or 10th, you know, there'd be one in there that she could mm-hmm. use at least. And I've just never worked like, I've just never, I've never, I, it's the, I'm really, I saw, I watched the film on Friday. Someone did a watch party here with a group of my friends on Zoom and they all clicked at the same time. And I felt like it was the first time I'd seen the movie. And I've seen it, you know, I hadn't seen it since October. And I was like, wow, isn't that interesting? I hadn't, I really feel like I saw it for the first time. Um, anyway, that's just, I'm rambling, but um, no, I feel I felt connected to, to Malcolm, you know, just as a human. That's really, I mean, I will say this, it comes across in the performance, obviously, especially seeing the more, the side of him that's not the fiery videos and it's it's literally more the who the man was and his charisma, but also just um, how humble he was and his questioning and all of that was so great to see. Um, Leslie, I, I spoke to Kingsley on a previous thing where he talked about, I guess it was the first week maybe that you guys did the big, I don't even call it a fight. We'll just call it like like a little bit of a verbal tussle. Um, and he said it was interesting because like, you know, you guys had to go at it. And I, I did you say that you were asking Kemp for more? You're like, look, he's coming at me with all these lines, Kemp, I need more. So tell me about that part. Oh, well, um, Brother Kingsley just came so exceptionally prepared. And, um, you know, it was really, oh, I, I I really remember it being, I mean, the first week and a half, two weeks of shooting was with, because because Kingsley was gonna, we were gonna lose him for a second to go work on another project. So we had to get a lot of his stuff done first. Uh, so it was just uh, so much material on him and the way it, the way the schedule laid out, uh, and in many ways, the way the thrust of the story is, you know, it is so much of, Malcolm's night. We're there for we're we've all gathered there for Cassius, so we think. Uh, but Malcolm has other plans for the way their evening is going to go. So uh, Kingsley was really driving that bus, and uh, I didn't get to respond for a good week and a half, if not more. You know, because we did the whole we did a lot of Kingsley stuff, and then we went and did the roof stuff, and then we came back, and my stuff kept getting my response kept getting pushed, which was good. I used all of that. But yeah, Kemp and I, I, there was just one as perfect and well-structured as Brother Kemp's script was. And it really was so exceptional. The best script I'd ever read. We all talk about it all the time. I just felt that there was a tiny bit missing uh, based on how well-crafted Malcolm's arguments were and how, how clear he was in his charge to all of us, but especially Sam. I just knew that when I did respond and Sam really only responds in that one moment, he responds finally, you know, as the final kind of um, moment of the picture. But in the, in the course of the evening, there's really only one time that he comes back. And yeah, I called Kemp and I said, you got to give me a little bit more. There was just, there was something that I said, uh, you know, Sam would have the specifics of the, the business specifics. I needed, I needed something to really shut that man up. Help me out. <laughs> Did it very well. I mean, there's a lot of lines I saw on Twitter that kept getting sp- spit over and over again, but I don't want a piece of the pie. I want the recipe is going to live forever. You might as well just put it on my bio now. Thank you, Kemp. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you all. Uh, Eli, bringing it to you, uh, everybody has a daunting uh, task with bringing a legend to life. Um, Aldous had prosthetics and Leslie's got to go and try and sing Sam Cooke and everything as we already talked with Kingsley. But I heard you say that champ was your just like the word champ. This is this thing that you hate. You're on mute, Eli, but go ahead. Yeah, it was, uh, I just felt, I remember there's a part uh, where I'm looking in the mirror, me and Aldous have a scene, and I, and I say, uh, heavyweight champ of the whole world, you know, and I just couldn't, it just kept not sounding right. It didn't sound like him, and it was, it was bothering me. Um, and I had to, I was just like, I'd call up my, my dialect coach, and I, I would literally just be like, 
I just say champ like 5,000 times on the phone and be like, did that sound right? Like champ, 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 champ. And he'd be like, yeah, bro, you're fine, you're good. You know, like just go do it. But like, no, but he, he would like, he would sit with me and we would actually work through it and like figure out like what, why wasn't it sounding right? What was different and stuff like that. But yeah, that was like just one of those little, one of those idiosyncratic things that just like, for you know, I felt like I had his whole accent down, but this one word that he says a million times it just, I just wanted to make sure I just, if I didn't get that right, then it would just, it would take me out of it. So I feel like it would take other people out of it. But yeah. I feel like there's something about that though. There's information in that because like that, yeah, the, the parts where we stumble, you know, especially when we're trying to get these people that lived, there's, there's, some, there's something about it that we're not believing yet. You know, it would, so it's, it's just, it's tr as we try to bring them close, we're going to find those places where they don't. I certainly had that with Sam too. Yeah. Yeah. And even in the scene with you, I said it again. I, I said, yeah. uh, champ, do you hear that? You know, I could get used to that. And that's, that, that again was like another one where I was just like, champ, champ, champ. But, but <laughs> it's like, you know, it's cool. Cause like, and, and obviously Kingsley was like doing this too, you know, as well. It's like, if you do that repetition, and you put in that muscle memory eventually when it clicks you're like ah all right you know and it's like it's like you can finally just like it settles in you somewhere you know uh, yeah no i'm glad that you bring that up because i really also just wanted to talk about the reason why i wanted to mention the champ portion is because you lived with muhammad ali slash cassius clay for a lot longer there was a different project and so how long were you working with the idea of trying to portray him for something total before you ever even auditioned for One Night in Miami? Oh, man. So it comes up the email from A.B. Kaufman. So, well, Kingsley would know. He got the role. When when did they start casting for that for that role that you beat me out for, Kingsley? You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> the first round was two, 2013 when you were probably too young yeah. and then it went away that was a universal then it went away for three years and then it came back in 2016. So 2016 is when I first started prepping went for it didn't get it Kingsley got it uh, <laughs> which I will bring up forever I uh, would but, never have brought that up, by the way. Only you. When I was a lot younger. But, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's the beautiful thing is that that was the motivation that made me say, okay, I want to play this role. There's someone else out there that's better than me at playing this role. But I think there'll be another opportunity. So let me get better. Let me work until I'm the best person in the world to play this role. And um, so at, after about two years, um, Nothing had come, and I was gonna do a play. Actually, let me show you something. You have a second? One second. One All right, second. do it. While you, while he's going to one second, Kingsley, bruh. I didn't. I mean, I knew that that you played it, but okay, go ahead. Well, this is the play. This is what I was gonna uh, do. I still have, I have a whole bunch of them. Fetch play, make man, and uh, it, I was, I was, I was, I had cast it. I was gonna put it up. It, it was gonna happen, and then. Um, and then someone called me and said, Regina King is looking for a young Cassius Clay and, uh, and all that. The rest is history. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad idea to share a role with, you know, Will Smith. Kingsley, it's not a bad idea to share a role with Denzel. I mean, this is oh. kind of like, you know, you jump into a very specific uh, group well, when you do what, that. That's, that's, but, what, that's what I'm saying. I was like, I was really surprised that there were people who who were saying no because they were like Denzel I was like no this is a great opportunity to like do something different with the role but I don't know yeah um I actually wanted to talk about the casting process um Aldis I mean all of you guys you guys have done a ton of stuff and Regina just recently said that one of the reasons why this ended up being the ensemble that it is is because you four gentlemen wanted to put in the work to actually sit down with her and audition and talk about the role. And a lot of other folks were just like, eh, I'm not going to do that. But then she said that that was like, I don't know, that was just the way she wanted to cast it. And I think it kind of makes it interesting because when you look at the ensemble, it is just that it is an ensemble and you guys are like this crew together. But 
Um, I just have to ask any of you, like if the, if the audition thing was something where you were like to somebody be like, I would audition for that no matter what. <laughs> like you were just like, I'm definitely gonna audition for this. I don't care who says it or I'll just, or did you maybe have to like think about it a second time? <laughs> no, for me, it was, uh, I had to think about it for a minute and it wasn't necessarily the project because the script was brilliant. Opportunity to work with uh, Regina is like, once in a lifetime. It was just trying to figure out whether or not I was adequate enough to honor Mr. Brown. I mean, he's still here. You know, I didn't know if I was, you know, uh, no fit for that. I mean, every time I, I take on uh, an accurate portrayal of somebody, I look at myself to see if I'm, you know, if I'm right, can I do that? You know, so I studied him a little bit. And at first I said, no, I don't think I'm it. But then after that audition came back around and my team was saying, look, you know, Regina says she wants to see you audition. And I was not about to tell Regina, no, I'm not about to directly sit here and be like, nah, Regina, I'm good. You know, holler at me on the flip side, like we go. <laughs> nah, it was, it was, uh, and it was, it was a good part of it too, because like I was in Australia, I, I was, uh, I was shooting. Uh, I was actually working on the Invisible Man at the time. So in Australia, we have a super huge time difference. So I'd probably be up at like four or five o'clock in the morning catching notes. Uh, and then I would go put myself on tape later that day. We'd be shooting at the sound station. I, in the middle of my lunch breaks or whatever, in, in between the scene, I'd go down and put stuff on tape. You know, I remember the first round I did, sent it in. Then Kim Harden, who was our, our fantastic casting director, hit me back. She said, Regina wants to get, you know, get on the phone with you for some notes. And that feels like you're getting sent to the principal's office because <laughs> you're like, all right, the director wants to highlight me. Oh man, like what I do wrong, <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, we had a fantastic conversation. I thought it was gonna be like 15, 20 minutes of notes, but it ended up being a couple of hours of chopping it up about culture and the significance of the film. And I saw where her mind and her passion really was on this film. So it was really an awesome experience to learn who she was in this particular moment before we even got to work. So. Casting came down, uh, you know, they hit me and they said, you know, that's, it's, it's going your way. And I said, all right, let's get to work. But, you know, I knew the importance of it. I love the script. I love the message and, and what it was about. But you're right. This is not a, a, a biopic about any one of these men individually. This is about a conversation. This is about a relationship. That is the, the, the star of this film. And it only works when you have four men who are equally invested in doing the work and supporting each other. And Regina said that part of her casting strategy was that she was looking for the essence. She wanted to make sure that the actors who were portraying these men weren't only good actors, brilliant actors. She, she wanted them to have the essence of these men that they're portraying. Cause that's a different thing that you're looking for, you know, with Cassius Clay and that, you know, that youthfulness, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Malcolm X being able to show a vulnerable side, but also there's that leader in there that you know is troubled and seeking something. There's Sam Cooke, who is, you know, you know, Mr. Suave and Debonair, but he's also a businessman underneath and he's gonna hit you with that and let you know he knows where he stands. And of course, Mr. Brown's Mr. Brown, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, they, 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 they all got a different swag to them, but uh yes. the essence, the essence had to be there. And that's that's why all four of us are sitting in these shoes today. She, she was looking with a different eye. You know, and I have to say that, um, you know, I was there for some of the rehearsals, but if I wasn't able to be there in person, Regina would always send me videos and we would talk about it because, you know, people don't realize we did chemistry reads, you know, um, Al Aldous was the first person cast and then he participated. I mean, I, I watched, of course, the chemistry read, read with um, Kingsley and Leslie. I watched the chemistry reads with, with Aldous and he like, we, it was this process of trying to build a four, four part harmony. And, um, you know, uh, enough props need to be given to uh, Kimberly Harden. And, and I think it's uh, casting is, because I know that article you're talking about and, and that mm -hmm. thing about people being unwilling, I, I, people don't, don't have an understanding of how all this works. I think I said before we started this, that this, is, this was an indie film. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, it, I, I don't want it, I think that when I read articles like that, it can kind of imply that actors are being bratty and that's not the case. It's just, you know, everyone has teams and representatives who are trying to help them make the, the best decision. And that's why it's so hard for small films like this 
to kind of come together with as good a cast as we were able to 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 get. And and I just you know I just want to kind of put it in perspective because when I read when I saw that it kind of felt a little bit like it wasn't like you know it was Will Smith who who was trying. Yeah. It was a, it's just like, <laughs> People don't even know that for a lot of agencies, it's offer only for, yeah. for, for our smaller films. So either their clients get a straight offer or you, they won't audition. And that's not like just A-list stars, that's like a whole, so just asking people to audition was really Regina kind of sticking herself out to me on, on behalf of this story. And, and just saying like, you know, it's really gonna be important that they embody the essence and these guys have a rapport with one another, a natural vibe so that we can believe that they're friends. Cause she was like, there's no way anyone's gonna be able to phone this in. Yeah, that's actually the, the part of it that I think really comes through. And I think that's the part why folks are already talking about how much legs it has. And that's why, you know, it's winning at TIFF and, you know, we have on all of these top 10 lists. It's because of that. It's because you do believe that the four, you four guys are friends. And so when, when I found out Leslie, that you and Kingsley, like hadn't known each other that much before this, it, it's strange because like, that's the way I fight with like my cousin. Like, this is like, we're so close. I want to hurt you sometimes. I'm so, <laughs> but what I wanted to say though, is if we look at the four men, they kind of all sit on a spectrum for how they want to approach their role in the civil rights movement and business. And if we look at it one way, you could say Malcolm the revolutionary is on one side and Sam the businessman is on the other. And when y'all come together in that scene, I just personally find it to be literally one of the best moments in it. And I was just curious, like set me up on like, what were the conversations between the two of you before you went to tackle it? How did the rehearsal process go? Like, just how did y'all approach the work? And uh, Kingsley, I'll start with you. I, well, I th that was the audition scene. <laughs> See, I, oh, she didn't hold back, boy. <laughs> yeah. And I remember I did four takes and they just weren't working. And then my pal, he went, he went, do it like you don't want the guards outside the room to hear you. And then it changed the whole thing. It just made it like that. And I looked at the other takes and it was just too shouty. I sent them all to Regina, but I remember going, don't just focus on take five. Um, and then I and then cut into me and Leslie. I remember feel I remember Leslie and I had a conversation about like, you know, shall we are you shall we kind of stay open to, you know, throwing each other off balance a little bit and you know, when the, when someone's getting their coverage, should we, you know, try and, you know, are we open just to check in and see if we were open to that? And we were. And, you know, there's probably some coverage on both sides where things were being said that you don't hear, you know, to mm. get uh, to get different things. Um, in terms of the argument, though, like I think Kempo Addis, they talk much better about you know, the debate and all of that, what it means. I was just definitely from an acting point of view, from a very like tunnel Malcolm action point of view. It was about trying to wake them up, trying to wake the room up to understanding, you know, and to mm -hmm. sort of, to try and get them to join forces. It was, um, you know, and the questions that come out of that, you know, is it enough, you know, is, is, is collaborating with within the system is that enough like what is enough who knows i don't know i just love that the i love that all these interesting questions were coming out of the narrative and not really knowing what the answer was um but i i, I had a great i had a great <laughs> i had a great time screaming at leslie on the first week <laughs> i know and then Leslie talk about you because we're going to get into the song in a minute, but yeah, the the work because a lot of the folks watching this are actors or, or familiar of it and that doesn't get talked about as much we all see your brilliant performances. But there's so much it's like I think you said the analogy of the ducks paddling so talk about your ducks paddling to sort of get ready for tackling that you know that day. Oh, uh, I remember King and I had um, a discussion early on about sort of the literal of like a oh, when did Sam and Malcolm meet and where would this have been in their relationship and all that stuff and and one of the things that I learned from Hamilton which um you know as we all know is also a piece of historical fiction in many ways it's a piece of science fiction in many ways you know we are we are taking uh some of the history and we're, we're they're obviously uh, 
it's a different it's a different language it's a different uh tools that we're using artistically to get this history over to to bring out other parts of the to bring out different shades of the story and different um things we, we haven't thought about and so that is you know in the way that art is um you know it's very rarely representational art is not you know I don't think it's really meant to do that. It is there for symbolism. It is there for metaphor. It is there for, uh, for, for other reasons, for us to see deeper into things. Um, we have our life. We have literal. We have documentary. We have journalism. We have things that are, you know, there to document things literally. Art is there to do something greater than that. And so uh, I think what I knew really based on my work, I have to say in Hamilton, I knew two things was that the writing is king, man. I mean, I, I spent so much of my career <laughs> um, thinking that I could make um, writing that was less than brilliant, you know, sing with how hard I worked on it. And you, you know, there's really not much you can do. Um, so, so I knew that uh, it, the, the way Lynn had, you know, given a room full of black and brown people that that text in order to show us what we were capable of, Kemp had done the same thing. And so we, if we just honored his rhythms and what he'd given us, we would be able to fly in that way. And I knew that um, in a way that their whole lives had to be present on that night. This was an interrogation of each one of these men, it was an interrogation of everything that was before that room and everything that would come after. Malcolm is in, it is in a way, he is a, he is a, a, um, a, a vision. He's, you know, he is, uh, forgive me, I've been up uh, with a toddler very early, but he is the representation of, of all of Sam's own insecurities facing back at him. So yeah, we don't know what, you know, was literally discussed discussed in the room, the room where it happened, as it were, you know, this is a, a an imagined account of what they what all of their, you know, legacies could have been on a night like that. And we became really protective of our guys, you know, I'm sure somebody else can speak to it too. We, we became, <laughs> we had, when we would be talking about how far we could go in these scenes, that there were, there were, there were discussions that that went on too long. <laughs> there were phone call, heated phone calls to Kemp. No, 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 absolutely not. So you gotta you, I mean, we went by the time we went to shoot, and that's how I knew I have to say, when I when I found some of that stuff, that's how I knew I was I was in the work, you know, because it had connected deeper than I even knew than I was aware of. I love that. I really do love that. Um, we we have to get out of here um pretty soon, but um I just again it's so incredible that. You guys were all able to assemble this incredible cast. I, I mean, you all have done some stuff that I've seen before and like that I like. I mean, Brian Banks, Hamilton. I mean, like you guys do it, ballers. I, whatever. But <laughs> I'm just curious if you could say when you were getting ready for this role, if there was what was the one thing if you that you stumbled across or that Kemp told you or that Regina told you that was sort of like your north star as far as the character maybe something that we don't know about the character or maybe something about the character's past that you think sort of prescribed what you were doing and Eli I know you watched a lot like with with the docs was there anything that that you found about Muhammad Ali clashes clay that was sort of like again that north star for the man um can you hear me yes yes um, I found two things um first of all with the boxing I I found an old picture of him when he was an amateur when he was maybe 12 or 13 years old and he was in a classic Queensbury boxing stance. And I realized from watching his fights early on that he actually, a lot of people said he didn't fight with traditional um, technique or mechanics, but, it, but it, it's not true. He actually did the exact same thing Miles Davis did with music, which was he mastered the, the, the fundamentals so well that he was able to now break the rules and keep the same structure and just use his distance because he knew you can't reach him from a certain distance if he knows your distance. And if you got close enough, he could easily come back. But it, he realized it slowed him down to try and move like this. 
So he, he, he mastered the fundamentals so well that he could break the rules. And when I saw that picture and I saw the evolution, I was like, oh, so it's not that he's just recklessly putting his hands down and recklessly kind of dancing about the ring. He's actually just operating with fundamentals on a higher level than most people can conceive. Um, and then the thing with his, with his uh, kind of just his persona, there was um, an interview with him on local radio in Louisville when he was about 20 years old, about a year and a half before he, he wins the, uh, his first world championship, heavyweight championship. And um, he gets a call and I listened to this interview almost every day in the morning. I would just put it on while I was making my breakfast. Like I just wanted to get his voice because he's taking calls from callers all over the city. And so I just wanted to know like how he interacted with people and it's like an hour and a half long. So it was just a great way to kind of start the day. Um, and there's one caller that calls in and I never noticed it probably until about two weeks of listening to it every day that it's a KKK member who is intimidating him through the phone call subversively and he's responding, trying to maintain his demeanor, but also subversively responding, knowing that as soon as he steps out of this radio station, he has to go back into the South as a black man and into Louisville, Kentucky and live his life. So it, it's a really, you know, you, you can hear him, you know, boy, you should really consider maybe not talking so loud when you're, you know, and then he's gone back like, oh, you know, I'm never gonna stop talking, but I don't mean no disrespect, but I'm just a champ and I believe in myself. And it's just, it's, it's like, there's a subtext where you think it's just a caller in him, but it's not, it's, you know, his life is on the line, but he's, but he's striving for something else. And it, and it really walking on both sides of the street um, is what I kind of referred to it as. And I feel like he did that um, better than anybody else. And that kind of helped me with my, my character. Yeah, it's a dog whistle death threat, which is just on a different level <laughs> altogether, especially at that time. Uh, Leslie, obviously, we're going to go ahead and say the North Star is Sam's music. And you you knew when you read the script, there's a line that says, oh, and then Sam goes into the um the uh talk show and then he's gonna sing a change gonna come and that's the line in the script that kemp wrote but then you <laughs> then have to you know embody one of the most iconic voices in the history of uh american music so i know you didn't want to imitate sam but but what how did you how did you approach that moment because again knowing that it's also the close of the movie and in a way when it bookends with aldous's opening Again, it's it, everything comes together in that. And so I wanted to know again, yeah, how did you do it? Because it's incredible. Well, singing is, in, singing is an oral tradition. And so Sam has been one of my teachers, one of my mentors for most of my life. Um, but I'd never crawled inside the recordings in the way that I did for this film, as you can imagine, trying to understand psych psychologically why does he take a breath there? Why doesn't he take a breath there? Because my instinct is, is to take a breath right there, you know, really trying to understand uh, what it took to create some of these recordings was a great insight into the heart and soul of the man. And I think my North Star was um, Sam Cooke live at the Harlem Square, which um, as a Sam Cooke fan, uh, I was embarrassed that I had never heard of, but there was a reason why I'd never heard of it is because it was a it was a recording that had been held back from the public for decades after he it was released at long after he passed away um, because it was a different Sam Cooke than we were used to so in the same way that you know here my dear or vulnerable are these sides of Mount of um of Marvin Gaye you know that uh that true fans of Marvin, you know, it's getting to know his B-sides that you get to know so much about Marvin. Uh, Sam Cooke live at the Harlem Square, him in front of that mostly black crowd where, at where most of what we knew of Sam was performing in front of mostly white audiences, you know, so that the code switching, you know, you really, I, I just really got another, it was another, it was a, a portal into uh, the soul of the man and who he might be amongst his brothers in this hotel room. That was my North Star. Love it. I literally could talk to you gentlemen for four hours about this movie um, and I would like to, but 
um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you at this moment. Thank you so much for sharing um, how you guys made this film and, of course, for bringing it into the world. And I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, you can watch One Night in Miami on Amazon Prime. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.